Hi everyone, I'm Lorraine Legassig. I'm a software engineer from Australia who specializes in user experience and accessibility. I'll be kicking off today's talk with a brief introduction to everything you need to know to be able to answer the question, is my data viz excluding people? Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Fossheim. I'm a developer and designer passionate about creating user-friendly, accessible and ethical products. Today, I will be showing examples of inaccessible data visualizations, and I will also explore what we can do to make our visualizations more inclusive. Hi, I'm Frank Galatsky, a staff data visualization designer and engineer at Visa, specializing in motion and interaction design and accessibility. I'll talk about what it takes to include people with disabilities in the design process, and then lead two brief interviews with screen reader users as they explore data visualizations. I'll end with a challenge looking to what the future might hold for all of us in this space. Is my data visualization excluding people? This is a question Frank, Sarah and I have asked ourselves at some point in the past few years, and we're excited to share what we've learned with you. The three of us are specialists in digital accessibility. For some of you, this might be the first time that you've heard this term. So let me explain briefly what we mean by when we say accessibility. Accessibility in the general sense, literal sense, is how easily something can be accessed. But when we talk about digital accessibility, we are talking about the discipline, the knowledge and the skills required to build digital products that are usable by everyone, in particular those with disabilities. When we say that something is accessible, it means that every person using the product can achieve the same goal or outcome, no matter their disability. So is asking, so asking is my data visualization accessible is another way of saying is my data visualization excluding anyone? Imagine this. What if one day you woke up to find that you were blocked from 70% of your favorite websites? Unfortunately, this is the reality for blind people who use the web today. Unless you've worked in government, most web developers, designers, and content creators don't know that accessibility is a thing. And this is one of the biggest reasons of why the state of accessibility is so bad on the web today. And those that do know what accessibility is don't know whether or not they're doing it correctly. The state of digital accessibility is due to a lack of awareness, a lack of resources and training in this fast evolving world of tech. And we're hoping that by sharing what we know, it might start to change. The goal of digital accessibility is to ensure that all people have the basic right of access to information. Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the web, said that from the very beginning, access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. When we build for disability, we must be familiar with all types of disabilities. The main categories include hearing, seeing, speaking, physical, and cognitive disabilities. The first step to building accessible products is being able to talk about disability and also the theory of dis and also a little bit of history of disability rights. You might be shocked to learn that ADA or the American with Disabilities Act, making it illegal to discriminate against people with disabilities was only passed just 30 years ago. And after 30 years, we still have a long way to go before we reach equality. By learning about disability, we're not learning to accommodate special needs. The exciting thing about accessibility is we have the power to fix dis systemic discrimination. The next thing to understand is that many disabled people use what's called assistive technology. These are devices or software that help them interact with their environment. In this talk, Sarah and Frank will both be demonstrating what it's like to use a screen reader. A screen reader is software that blind people often use to navigate the computer, smartphone, or tablet. It not only reads out the screen, but it, become, but it comes with a bunch of handy keyboard shortcuts to make it faster to get around. Um, there's a whole lot of assistive technologies out there, including refreshing braille displays, zoom magnifiers, switch controls, head wands, voice control, and many more. It's really important to know all the different ways that people might interact with their device and with your product. 
A question I often get asked when I give talks about accessibility is why can't we just make the assistive technology smarter? And assistive technology is getting better every day, but it's not quite there yet. And we need to meet assistive technology halfway by building things in an accessible way. Assistive technology is how disabled people show up and we need to make sure we meet them at the door. The next thing you need to learn about is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG for short. Just like physical buildings have a bunch of disability standards, the WCAG is a set of rules that help, make, help check if websites are accessible. A checklist of sorts. It was created and maintained by a group of global accessibility and web experts now called the Silver Task Force. If you've ever heard of ADA compliance, Section 508 or VPAT, they all require you to meet the rules outlined in WCAG. We personally recommend you check out WCAG 2.1 as it's the most recent and WCAG 2.0 is all over 10 years old. And exciting news is that WCAG 3 is coming out very soon. This is an example of most commonly needed criteria. 1.1.1, non-text content. All non-text content that is presented to the user has a text alternative that serves the equivalent purpose. What this means in plain language is that images on the internet require a text description so that blind users can know what they are. And that includes charts and data visualizations, which are images most of the time. Unfortunately, 66% of websites fail this very simple but very essential criteria, according to a survey conducted by WebAIM. The first thing that you can do right now is add alt text to your images. If you write HTML, you can add the alt attribute to your image tag. If you post on social media like Twitter, you can Google how to add text descriptions to my images on Twitter. The hardest part is actually knowing what to write in the text description. And I highly recommend you read the blog post, Writing Alt Text for Data Visualization by Amy Cecil. Checking off every rule in WCAG does not guarantee to make your product accessible. You need to consider accessibility at all parts of the project. Um, especially making sure that you test with people with disabilities. And finally, I'd like to touch briefly on inclusive design. Adoptive inclu adopting inclusive design in your organization is one of the best chances at making your products accessible. accessible. Inclusive design forces us to check our biases, recognize exclusion, and make sure that we build with disabled people. Inclusive design doesn't mean that we build a one-size-fits-all solution, but forces us to think about how we might build our product in a way that offers different pathways for different people to achieve the same outcome. Inclusive design makes us shift our mind sh mindset to think about moments of disability. One of the biggest light bulb moments for me was finding Microsoft's Inclusive Design Toolkit, which included the Persona Spectrum. This is a tool that lets us think about disability as permanent, temporary, or situational. Here is an example. Adding captions to audio and video. While this is essential for deaf people, it also helps people with temporary impairments such as an ear infection, or in situations such as loud or quiet environments. Maybe you're on the train to work and you forgot your headphones that day. As a bonus, captions also allow you to watch films in a language that you don't know. And it's been shown to help students remember their course content better. And you can also search through text transcripts much faster than searching through the audio or video itself. Frank will talk a bit more about inclusive design later, but one of the benefits of inclusive design that we repeat again and again is that building for disability usually makes a better experience for everyone. So I've barely scratched the surface, but I hope that I've been able to give you a broad introduction to what you need to know before making your data visualizations accessible. Now it's my pleasure to pass you on to my co-speaker, Sarah, who is going to show you how to get started. So at this point, you're probably very excited to start making your data visualizations more accessible. And you might also be wondering how to do that. I had the same question a few years ago, and I went to Google back in the day to find the answer. And after reading several tutorials and blog posts and articles, I came to the conclusion that I had to design for color blindness. And that was a good call. My graphs at the time were mainly using green and red as their colors. Running that through a 
color blindness simulator, I quickly found out that that was not a good color palette. For several types of color blindness, the green and red would look almost the same, meaning that for those users, it would be really critical information that got completely lost at them. Both bars look the same. So I went for a different color scheme, and in addition, I also added patterns so that I was not just relying on color to give information to the user. And I was so happy with it. I thought I did the right thing. I thought my graph was fully accessible and the work there was done. But that was wrong of me. There's so much more to database accessibility than just color blindness. Color blindness is one of the most talked about topics within the accessibility world, but there's a lot more out there than that. And I quickly realized that color contrast is one of those things. While I changed up my color palette to accommodate for color blindness, I forgot to keep contrast in mind. And the foreground and background color of my graphs, of my bars in the graph, was not high enough. This mainly impacts people with low vision or vision impairments, but it also impacts people who are using bad screens or are using screens in suboptimal light conditions. Something else that's not often talked about when it comes to color is bright colors or the brightness and intensity of it. And this is something that I often myself experience as something negative. A few years ago, I got a concussion. And ever since then, I have been much more sensitive to bright colors. And reviewing the accessibility of the data visualizations around the US presidential elections of 2020, being on the CNN website that uses very bright red and blue colors throughout their design and all their different components, it actually triggered a headache in me that didn't go away until the next day. And I actually had to stop working that evening and take care of my health just because I looked at CNN's website for a bit too long. Moving away a bit from color and more at the conceptual and UX level of things, we have to make sure that the data is understandable. Often in data vis accessibility, it can be useful to show the same data in different formats to make sure everyone understands it. For example, this 538 graph trying to display who was predicted to win the US elections leading up in the weeks before it. They already wrote the summary of the graph in the title. Biden is favored to win the election. Then you can see the statistics underneath in numbers. You can see the same numbers visualized with dots, so something way more visual and spatial. Trump and Biden are not only represented with words, but their picture is there as well, making it even quicker to make the connection. And finally, the blue for Democrats and red for Republicans also helps recognizing what the data is about. And in addition to that, it's also explained underneath the graph. On the more technical side of things, we have to think of stuff like keyboard accessibility. Everything that's on the graph that you can interact with, with your mouse, you should be able to interact with using only your keyboard as well. We should be able to navigate the graphs using our keyboard the way we can using our mouse, but it's often forgotten about, and it's a very important one to remember. Something else that's more technical is making it work for a screen reader. Screen readers, such as, for example, vo VoiceOver for Mac, they will read what's displayed on the page. And unless you're using a data viz library that already puts a lot of focus in screen reader accessibility, you will have to do quite a bit of technical work there yourself. Let's take a look at an example. This is from Fox News. During the elections, they had a page that live updated as the electoral college votes came in. And the progress bar underneath would show how many votes from each state each of the candidates had gathered already and how close they were to getting the 270 that they needed to win. However, Let's listen to what it's like for a screen reader. Joe Biden image 306. Joe Biden. Kamala Harris. Donald Trump image 232. Donald Trump. Mike Pence. One votes. One votes. 20 votes. Four votes. Two votes. 11 votes. 10 votes. 10 votes. 16 votes. Six votes. 14 votes. Four votes. Five votes. 29 votes. Four votes. Seven votes. 20 votes. Three votes. 13 votes. 12 votes. 10 votes. 11 votes, 9 votes, 55 votes, 7 votes, 3 votes, 16 votes, 3 votes, 29 votes, 6 votes, 9 votes, 3 votes, 
3 votes, 5 votes, 6 votes, 38 votes, 11 votes, 3 votes, 9 votes, 18 votes, 7 votes, 3 votes, 15 votes, 2 votes, 3 votes, 10 votes, 6 votes, 8 votes, 8 votes, 11 votes, 6 votes, 6 votes, 4 votes, 1 vote, 1 vote, 1 vote. 81,283,495 votes, 81,283,495 votes, 51.4%, group, 270 needed to win, 74,223,755 votes, 46.9%. That was a mouthful. So the Fox News developers actually put in an effort to make sure that one vote, two votes, three votes, ten votes, that those would be registered to screen readers and that those could be communicated to blind people. And that's good, except they didn't add the extra information that's there in the graph. In the graph, visually, you have the blue color and red color to at least know which candidate those votes belong to. None of that is translated into the screen reader experience, and all the blind person gets from their screen reader is just random numbers. Therefore, it's important to remember that we're not just making the data available to screen readers. We're just not just exposing our data to screen readers. We're not just making it work with a screen reader. We have to design a good screen reader experience. And it's important to keep that in mind because it can help in making a better screen reader experience into making better accessible graphs to include the designers in the process of coming up with a screen reader experience. In the end, we're, we're designing what our graphs should look like visually. We're designing how people should interact with them visually. We also should design how people will communicate with the graph and, and with their other senses. For example, how people will hear the graph or how people can feel the graph. And the way that it can be solved is going to be very case dependent. A lot of this depends on why your graph is going to be used. Who is going to use it? What kind of data will be visualized there? What type of visualization is it? Are you trying to tell a story or are you trying to communicate concrete information? Will your user have to do something with the graph? Will they have to interact with the graph? How static is the information or how dynamic is the data? And so on. There's a lot to keep into consideration. There's a lot to accessibility. So far, we've looked at screen readers, keyboard interaction, color combinations, color contrast, color brightness, and there's a lot more that we could be discussing, from fonts and sizes to patterns, animations, scroll behavior or language, and even a lot more different aspects. There's so much to data viz accessibility, and it's such an exciting space to be in. But throughout all of that, we have to remember that accessibility is more than just a checklist. We're not just making sure that disabled people can access our products. We also want to make sure they have a good, fair and user-friendly experience while doing so. And in order to achieve that, we really have to prioritize accessibility across our workflow, from the planning process to research, design, implementation, testing, and everything around and in between. Accessibility should be a priority. In the end, Accessible graphs will be better graphs for everyone. And on that note, I will pass the words to Frank. Thanks, Sarah. So I'm going to start off my section with a quippy one-liner from the inclusive design community. Design for one, extend to all. What does that mean? It means you include people with disabilities. You design an excellent experience for them. And oftentimes, you can extend that design, and it's going to be a better experience for all kinds of other people. You can look to the past at what's called the curb cut effect. It's with people with, in wheelchairs, the disability advocates pressured their cities to cut curbs. Curbs are those separations between a sidewalk and the road. And when that happened, when cities cut curbs, it turned out to be better for almost everybody. People with children, with walkers, with strollers, carrying groceries, distracted on the phone. It's just better when you design for people with disabilities and extend that design to others. So what's the curb cut effect for data viz? That's what I really want to know. And I think the way to get there is to start talking to people with disabilities and see what they need and what works for them. And we're going to do that. I have brought in two folks 
experts in both data viz and disability. They're both blind screen reader users. We're just going to see what are their thoughts on data viz today. So we have Leonie Watson here of Tetralogical joining us as a, both a subject matter expert, somebody who's worked with data visualizations and an accessibility um, analyst, advocate, expert. Leonie, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you. I was in my mid-20s when I lost my sight. had been working on the web for, for some years before that. And as a way to learn how to use a computer again with a screen reader, I decided to do a, a distance study course with the university and it was called you your uh, computer and the internet so the subject matter was perfectly known to me but what wasn't was how to use my computer uh, it got me hooked though and I ended up doing a complete computer science degree and of course that came with all sorts of visualizations of different kinds of data and that was the point that really started uh, piquing my kind of interest both as an engineer a problem solver and now someone who had a disability and actually how can we make these experiences not only accessible but actually usable, maybe even enjoyable. What do you most enjoy about data visualization when it's done well? Getting at the information. Data visualization is an extraordinarily useful thing for sighted people. Uh, it, it fulfills a very necessary purpose. It condenses a lot of information into a way that's a lot more approachable than having text presented at you, often lots of text. It's just the ability to get at that same information uh, but just framed in a different way, letting the thing do what it was supposed to do in a way that, that means I can use it. But what advice do you have for writing alt text descriptions that are effective? The first thing I would suggest is don't try and do everything with the alt text. Uh, there's often a temptation to try and explain the entirety of the data viz. So they really need to be kind of short concise and just to illustrate what the data is, is and, and what it's about. Uh, you need to then look at other techniques to provide the kind of more granular information. You have a data viz you'd like to share with us and kind of demonstrate your use of. This chart is actually one that Leonie has, has put together. So this is an SVG that shows somewhat old data now, but it's the market share of different screen readers at the time it was created. Uh, visually, it's uh, a line graph. And I thought this would make uh, a good experiment because as the SVG in its original state, it completely wasn't screen reader accessible at all. Uh, we could have given it an alt text that said you know, it was a, a line graph showing screen reader market share, and that would have done the trick. But actually, I think it's a lot better if we can make the experience as equivalent as possible. So I used some ARIA to give the SVG the semantics of an HTML table, uh, and that meant I could navigate through it up and down, left and right, uh, in a way that made the data meaningful. So uh, if I show you now, I can take the shortcut that will take me to the table. Six columns and four rows. Column one, row one, time. So I know I've got six columns and four rows of, of data. And if I use my screen reader's uh, shortcut key for moving down through that first column. JAWS graphic row two. Okay, I've got a row for JAWS. NVDA graphic row three. And a row for NVDA. And now what I can do is use my screen reader's command for moving horizontally across the row. Jan 2009, 8% graphic column two. So I can hear there that in January 2009, it had 8%. If I keep going, Tech 2010, 34.8% graphic, column three. December 2010, it had gone up to 34%. And so by using those kind of table semantics, although they don't map precisely to the visual presentation, the data is still actually both meaningful, understandable, and navigable uh, using a screen reader. And, and that's really kind of, I think, the, the go-to uh, experience that, that we should aim for with data visualizations. My last question then is, what, what's something you would do to improve this? Well, what I'd like to do, I can't yet do, and use the same technique, uh, but for more complex visualizations. Uh, and at the moment, we've got two blockers getting in the way of that. One is that we don't have the ARIA semantics for a lot of uh, different kind of forms of, of data visualization. You know, we can turn line graphs and bar charts into tables, flow charts into lists, for example, but that's about as far as we can get. Something like a Venn diagram would be next to impossible and anything even more complicated would be, you know, uh, far beyond that. The other blocker is that uh, trying to get SVG, ARIA, browsers and screen readers to play happily together is, is still something of a battle. The support needs to get better, more consistent and more robust across, across all the different technologies that are deployed. 
And next is Ryan Shugart. Thank you, Frank. Uh, my name is Ryan. I work at Microsoft as an accessibility subject matter expert in their cloud and AI division. I work with over 700 different product teams, helping them understand how to make their products accessible. And this includes doing a lot of work with data visualization and helping teams figure out how to produce accessible and meaningful data visualizations. Based on your experience, on your work, what percentage of charts and graphs and data visualizations that you encounter are an accessible experience? I really am sorry to say that the vast majority are not accessible. One of the things I wanted to know is, are there any products or platforms or libraries that you think do a pretty decent job? Maybe they don't make a visualization accessible, but they make it possible to work towards accessibility. Well, you know my answer to this one. Honestly, I use the High Charts library and highly recommend that. That is the one that we recommend standard at Microsoft for people creating data visualizations. So how about we have you share your screen with us as you explore a visualization uh, made with high charts? I'm going to start the way exploring this the way I would explore most any web page out there, and that is using the H command in JAWS to get an overview of what's on this page. Most common desktop screen readers heading level five. And now I can use my down arrow key to explore further. Line chart with six lines. Source colon web AIM. Click on points to visit official screen reader website. Line chart demonstrating some accessibility features of high charts. The chart displays the most commonly used screen readers and surveys taken by web AIM. From December 2010 to September 2019, JAWS was the most used screen reader until 2019. When NVDA took over, VoiceOver is the third most used screen reader. Followed by narrator, Zoom text slash fusion had a surge in 2015, but usage is otherwise low. The overall use of other screen readers has declined drastically. I like that description. Without even needing to go into details in the chart itself, um, that just gave me a good overview of what are the overall general trends. And that may have answered my question right then and there. In your own words, if you could help inspire folks, what's one thing that you think, or maybe a couple things that you think is really good about this chart specifically? The first is I can use the screen reader commands that I'm already familiar with. And for someone who maybe is not that familiar with data visualization, this is really easy to process. If it didn't say chart, you wouldn't even know that this was a chart. The other thing they do, and we didn't demo this because I don't know if this chart has it, but they have multiple ways to consume this information. And the final thing I want to mention that high charts that they have done and I would encourage everybody to do is they asked questions. They reached out to people with disabilities and they said, how would you like this to look? Go get to know your users, go find your users, talk to your users, sit down with them, have meetings with them. If you can do user research studies, do that. But even if you can't, just an hour long talk with someone who's using a screen reader or is using a switch or is using a magnification and just understanding what they do will help build your empathy and, and take you very far toward building an experience that you can help encourage everyone to use. I love what they said and I don't have anything to add to that. Now my only question is what happened to our innovative spirit? We've all come together here at Outlier for in some way, shape, or form because of visualization. And uh, history has shown us that we didn't always just represent data visually. We sometimes had multimodal ways of doing this. You see here, 200 years ago, we had embossed tactile maps. And thousands of years ago, we had uh, representations, this multimodal kipu is a collection of threads and knots, and it could be felt as well as seen, and it's a complex storage device for commerce and relationships, who owns what. This particular um, device lasted several civilizations and even through a, a massive empire, and it was a cornerstone of, of, of 
processing information and allowing people to do things. And we live in a similar world today where we have data and data visualizations and these tools that allow people to make decisions in business and government and in your personal lives. But we're excluding a lot of people from the power of data because the tools we have make it so easy to visualize, but they also make it easy to visualize things wrong and inaccessibly. And my challenge to all of you is to start advocating. Pressure Tableau and Excel and our studio to be more accessible. And in your own work, include people with disabilities. Start having conversations, make some friends. Maybe today is pretty rough. Maybe data visualization isn't doing so good. But I'm gonna stake a claim. And that claim is that the future is accessible. And let's get there together.